Judy Helfand, he just spoke to me a little while ago. Hi, Ernest. How you doing? Okay. Wow. Well, it was really a treat to talk with you for that little bit that I did get to talk to you. <laughs> you must have heard some from, from some of the rest of them. Well, I'll tell you, it's been very, very difficult to find the people who are actually part of the union and in the flying squadrons. Uh -huh. Very, very difficult. And we've been really wanting to try and, and talk with people who you know, who are part of leadership, like your friend, or who who are still, you know, young enough to be able and clear enough to be able to oh, talk way, about this. Uh, this Claude Helton, his, his wife worked in the Parkdale Mill. Really? Was she involved in the union there? Well, you have to talk to them. Okay. His, his, wife, his wife is named Mabel. Okay. And her name was Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N at that particular time. Mabel Nelson and, at Parkdale. Uh, she's married to Claude Helton now. Uh-huh. So there would, be, there would be a beginning of information because he was actively involved in it. Right. Because I, I saw him stand at a big gate at, one, at the Groves Textile Mill in Gastonia and refused to let a company truck go through and a fellow driving a truck crushed him against the gate and the gate gave you know, he didn't get hurt. Now, that's how that's how fanatical he was about the union. Wow. And of course, you know, uh, all the union people grabbed the truck driver out. It was going to lynch him till the cops come out and drug him back into the mill office. Little things like that, though. It just that sort of stuff went on the whole three or four weeks. I see. Now w there was a lot of organizing that went on prior to that strike, wasn't there? Oh yeah, it was. It was the thing to do. Be a union man. <laughs> Big deal. Now, when did you join? Huh? When did you join up? When did I turn up? No, when did you join up? Did you join? Oh, uh, I had belonged to it. I never paid much attention to it, really, uh, until they, they got his, got hysterical and, and pulled the strike. Because it was just something you joined to be with a crowd. Really? It was a social thing. But weren't people frightened to join this? Uh... At that particular time, I think uh, I think the Roosevelt administration had uh, declared it illegal to stop people from joining the union, and they had no fear of. It. You right. remember what Roosevelt did when he set up the uh, the uh, system of uh, well, it, it's still in fact it still it still is against the law for a plant owner to uh, keep people from joining the union. This happened in the 32, 33 area. Right, right. That's when they went on the eight-hour day, right? Yeah. Well, Roosevelt, uh, he set that up, too, with, of course, you know, the steel workers union. All, there's a lot of union workers up, up north. In the south, never had the privilege because they were intimidated by the mill owners. Right. So now what, but, but all of a sudden, everybody said, hey, I'm going to do it, huh? Well, uh, you're, you're, you don't, you know, the local union members, as far as I can remember, had nothing to say about pulling the strike. It was the union bosses that did that. Right. They, uh, it's like sheep following another sheep to the slaughter. I see. It was one of those thing type situations, I assume. Now, what... Because I, was, I wasn't that uh, aware, I was not interested that much in the union, because my father was anti-union, and uh, he never said anything to us because he was, he was what they call overseer capacity. It was against the law for him to start to stop us, uh, right. his two son, oldest, three oldest sons, from joining. But that must have caused some problems in the house, right? No, but believe it or not, he 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 never was what you call uh, a fanatical about it or redneckish. We used to call it. Uh huh. It was one of those things. Well, you boys do what you want to do. <laughs> you know, attitude. So, what were these meetings like? What were they like? Yeah. Most of it was just like social, having cookouts and. And uh, what do you call it? Box lunches and covered dish suppers and uh, socially, and then they'd have a little business meeting and and uh, little things like that. There was never, as far as the, the meetings I attended, there was nothing fanatical going on. Uh, nobody was getting armed or anything like that. They wouldn't. Uh, they wasn't bloodthirsty bunch. Right. Now, how did the town respond to these people once All they these, did the strike? The newspapers were natural for the mill owners. Right. Gastonia Gazette, the Atkins boys owned the Gastonia Gazette. 
they kept trying to warn uh, the people not join the union, go on strike. It always leads to trouble. And they went on and talked about the time when uh, our sheriff got killed, at, or deputy, I wonder if it was the sheriff or the deputy. Sheriff the Adderholt. Huh? Adderholt? H-O-L-T? I, know, I think it was, yeah, Adderholt. Well, I don't know about that. We used to call him Sheriff Holt, see. Right, anyway, right. Anyway, he was in the forefront of, I think it was called Lowray Mill at that time. Uh, or I don't think it was Firestone. Man, Blue Jeeps. That mill changed hands about three or four times there in 10 or 20 years. It went from uh, Low Ray Mill to Manville Jinx, from Manville Jinx to Firestone. That's where the, uh, the deputy sheriff got killed. And we lived only about five or six blocks away. We could hear the gunfire. <laughs> My father took us and went downtown to Gastonia, took us to the movie to keep us from seeing or hearing it. <laughs> and now, the movies were on a nickel, nickel throw at those days. They were silent movies. Now, did you... did? What happened after the strike was over in Gastonia? Oh, there was a lot of heartache, a lot of, a lot of tension in the plants where the people who, who really wanted to work had tried to get back in the plant after they went on a strike. There was naturally hard feelings, and, you know, it was all the foreman and, and the, the supervisor personnel could do to keep them from getting locked in one another, and, you know, getting to, uh, physical contact. Fights. Yeah. There, there would have been a lot of fights if the mill owners hadn't... Uh, organized completely and had a signal whereby if something happened on one floor, all the supervisory personnel would rush to that floor and clear it up right away. Now, did a lot of people lose their jobs after that strike? As far I as don't remember anybody losing their jobs. Really? Not anybody. That's interesting. The union just went completely busted. <sighs> I Ju mean, it was completely busted. That was it. So, I mean, it got busted, and what happened? What does busted mean? It didn't, it didn't exist anymore. Huh. They could, you couldn't, they, they could have organized, but nobody would join it. The union failed the workers. As far as I could tell, that's what had happened, because, hey, <laughs> they closed up their union hall. The meeting stopped. Mr. Hartman and Mr. Helton, they never did take them back in the plant, because they were, they were considered personnel uh, in the supervisor capacity at that time. I see. Uh, you know, they, they call them timekeepers. Right. Uh, I think Helton was a timekeeper, like a little bookkeeper of some sort. And that's why he was uh, <clears throat> Secretary of Treasury of the Union. And uh, he went selling insurance. It was Virginia Life Insurance Company for years after that. So he never went back into the mill? Never, ever went back into that mill. Uh, and neither did Mr. Hartman. And Mr. Hartman was, was the president? Well, I guess you'd say... You know, the Union, in that, that area, uh, Gastonia was 100% textile employee. I mean, it was 100 and, somebody took one time, it was 108 separate individual cotton mills in the county of Gaston, G-A-S-T-O-N. Right. And they all hired from 300 up to 3,000. The Firestone has a seven-story building, and they, they, held, they hired about three or 4,000 people. At, at that time, they had eight-hour shifts. Right. So, in the whole, all three shifts, they said, was total pretty close to 3,000 people in that plant. No wonder they wanted to organize that mill in 1929. There were so many people there, huh? Yeah. Well, it, it covered nearly all of West Gaston. Now, let me ask you a question. The local that you belong to, it, that took people from lots of different mills. It wasn't just from one three, mill, right? Three mills was uh, three plants, which each one of them had, uh, I think each one of them had about 600 each. And, and and that was your local? That was our local, and Mr. Hartman was president of our local. Now, there was another head knocker over him of all the rest of them, like, you know, Central, then one in West, South, East, and North. Right. See, Who? That way, well, just then they, the, all these local presidents got together, and they was the one that called a strike. Of I course, see. they didn't have anything to do with it because the national organization told right. them to go on strike. Right, exactly. You know, I, I happen to have a list of some of the names of the local presidents uh -huh. and their secretaries. Yeah. Uh, could I run some of them by you? Oh, yeah. Oh, great. I would not know them now. Okay, I know, I know. But just let's see if any of those jog with your memory, okay? Yeah. Hold on.
Hi there. Um, now, let's see. I had for, um, let's see, where would you be? West Gastonia, huh? West Gastonia. Yeah, well, not for Gastonia, I have a guy named C.J. Galloway. Galloway? Yeah. That was a common name in his big family up Really? If you could name a half a dozen, I probably wouldn't know them. <laughs> okay. Well, that would just happen that, to that, be... That town was clannish. It really? We had your family. Uh, two and three generations all lived in the same area, the same uh, home. You know, just block after block could it'd be just like all right. families just about. Right, right. East Belmont, North Carolina. Uh, East Belmont. Right. East Belmont. Well, okay, that's there was Belmont. a guy from Dame Jane, James Carter, and he was the acting secretary in the East Belmont. Yeah, he was. Did you know him? No, no. Okay. Except when he got to be cast on the city manager. <laughs> James Carter became city manager? Yes, ma'am. Same guy? Same guy. He was a he was he was well liked. He was he's a good organizer and he was smart. Is he still alive, you think? I don't know. You know, he ended up here in Florida in Lake Wales as the city manager of Lake Wales after he fall out of favor with a Gastonia bunch. Wait, he went to Lake Lake Wales, Florida? Florida and become city manager. City manager of Lake Wales, Florida? Yes, ma'am. Now, that's not where you live, is it? Oh no, not quite. That's a little bit east a little bit east of me, about forty miles. Where do you live? Aha! I want to stay incognito. You want to stay incognito? Yeah. You wouldn't let me come visit you? You? Yeah. My wife would hang you. What? Your wife would hang me? Yeah. Why? You sound cute. You sound like you're uh, intelligent, and you're you be you're really I guess you'd classify as a smart cookie. Well, I'll tell you, I'm traveling with a 75 year old man who's from Winston Salem. Uh huh. My granddaughter just graduated from Wake Forest. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, He's that's working for the uh, A&T and T bookkeeping company that writes all of the telephone checks. So you don't, so so you don't live in North Carolina anymore. Oh, I left there 33 years ago. You left there 33 oh, years yeah, ago? I made my millions down here in Florida. You did. Oh yeah. Wow. Ha! Huh. How do you like that? What do you mean? Well, I just mean that's interesting. So you get the Charlotte Observer? I don't get the Charlotte Observer. So how'd you find out about us? Well, my son uh, was, was, grew up in Gastonia on what they call the Lord Dallas Road. Right. Just about a block from Flint Grove School. Yeah. And he uh, is now, of course, he, he, he lived here in Florida. Then he made his millions, and he moved back to Cashier Highland area and bought him a 77-acre track and built a mountain home on top of it. Wow. He takes the Shaw Observer. And he cuts it out. Anything that's interesting like that, he knew I was involved in. He sends me the copies. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Now, I, I get out to to Florida every once in a while. And do you want to know an interesting thing? Yeah. I was having such a hard time finding people that had been part of the union movement that I started to write letters to people that were living in Florida thinking, well, maybe these folks left town because they couldn't get their jobs back or that kind oh, of thing, no. and maybe they went to Florida. Oh, no. I, uh, after the strike, I, I went into uh, the service station business. So you, you got out of the mill business, oh, too? Oh, no. Yeah. I, well, I got out because there's more money otherwise. Right. And after uh, I worked at the Atlantic, Shell Serv- Atlantic Station, in the Main Street in Belmont to de- December, uh, was it December the 7th, when the war broke? Yeah. Okay. When that war broke, then I went to Wilmington, North Carolina, worked two and a, two and a half or three years in the shipyard. I got tired of that because both of my brothers were in Italy fighting the war and writing back such horrible stories. I thought, well, hey, they going to get have experience I wouldn't have. So I quit the shipyard <coughs> and volunteered for the Navy. So I spent two and a half years in the Pacific. Wow. On the in a, duty. Uh-huh. And then you came back? Came, I came back. I went into war surplus equipment. Made, oh. made me some money. Yeah. I built the first I built the first motel that has ever built in Gaston. You did? Oh, yeah. Really? Is it it's still the, there? Oh, now it's called the Caravan Motel. Uh-huh. I sold it to Philip. Uh, and uh, he run it in the ground. Just, mm. just took all the profit. Now it's just a pile of junk. Oh boy! And then you left there and you went to Florida. Uh, yeah. When I run it for ten years, in 1951, from 1951 to 1959, 
I came to Florida in 1958 for the winter. And never left. No, no. <laughs> back and come back and stayed from 59 on. Wow. Now, did uh, did people talk about this strike in the Union ever again? You'd be surprised. After people went back to work, just in no time, nobody mentioned it. Now, you could, uh, you know how people gather and have a little social uh, yakking, talking before they went to work? Like, yeah. We call it a bull session. Yeah. <coughs> and, you know, that stuff gets old after a while, and nobody got to talk with it, talking about fishing out. That was a prime, uh, what do you call it, sport. Fishing and hunting. And uh, there wasn't no time for the people that was in the union went on strike and the people that didn't go on strike. Well, nobody worked, period. It was just like everybody was on strike, but there, there, was, more, there was a majority nearly in every plant that was unionized. You know, yeah. so you, you couldn't say too much for or against one of somebody belonging to the union and somebody was called a scab. But, but, yeah, but this is before the strike, right? No, you're after talking the strike. after the strike. I'm talking how, how they that they socialized, right? But did, sit around uh, country company stores. Did people still so did people still belong to locals after that? Did no, it, ma'am. No, ma'am. I, I said no, ma'am. No, but okay. The reason is, as I said, yeah, it completely disappeared. There's mm-hmm. no union organizers. There was no union in that town in that county. There was not a sign of any sign, as far as I can tell, about a union. Wow. It just, it just, just completely, it's like it sunk in the ground and ground closed around it. Oh, boy. It just, just faded away. So it was there for about a month, it was just like war. Mm-hmm. These, uh, what you call them, flying squadrons go from uh, town to town, Belmont, Mount Holly, Gastonia, Cherryville, Lincoln, and uh, Lincoln was in another county, but the one that they stayed within their counties. <clears throat> And, and you went on these flying squadrons. Oh, yeah. It was excitement. <laughs> I bet. I you bet. bet. <laughs> well, I don't bet. I mean, I've seen you some always, pictures. You know, you, you couldn't. It was a dry county and a dry state at that time. So everybody had a little something to drink. you call moonshine. Or some of them were referred to as rot gut. Yeah. It's a foul liquor, but it would get you high. <laughs> Now, were, were, were people, I mean, how did the town respond to you? Did they think that you were all a bunch of hooligans or something? Uh, that would be that would be a, a, a terminology we would use now. Mm-hmm. But it was respectable at that time because that was the thing to do. To join the union? Well, join the union, and, and uh, you had nothing to do in these little communities. And so it says, hey, they're going to pull a flying squadron to go so-and-so and close down a plant. What, 90% of the crowd that went were not involved. It was just about 10% of the, maybe 100 cars that went off on those trips. And most of them were looking for excitement. I know that, you know, me being a young sporter, I'd just go on for the excitement. Right. I was, cause, you know, there was guns involved with the sheriff meet you, meet you to Bill Finch, you know, and Kevin, uh, Vince would be fenced in, the doors, gates locked. <laughs> now, did, 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 did you, um... What, what happened, I mean, did you ever have to go, what happened to your dad's mill? I mean, did your dad's mill close? Oh, we had, they had to close it while, there for a week or two, it was closed. Uh-huh. But then after about the second or third week, they just opened the plant up, and those that wanted to come worked, and those that didn't, they didn't try to hire nobody. And uh, they just run part of the machinery. If half people showed up, they just run half the machinery. Oh, and wh- I, you, do you remember the National Guard coming into town? The National Guard, well, we had a company of guards right there in Gastonia, and uh, they stayed in they stayed in their barracks or their uh, headquarters. They, I never seen them come out well, on any trip we went on. They, none of them showed up. Okay, because I... I think you're talking about the strike that came when, when the, the deputy got killed. No, no, no. I'm talking about 1934, too. Well, I don't know about yeah. the guards getting involved in any, in any of those mill okay. strikes. Did you go down to Kannapolis? No, I didn't go over there with that bunch. Okay. Because you didn't have that kind of money, kid. You mean to get in the car and go to Kannapolis? I owned the car. You did? I couldn't get nobody to buy their share of gas to go anywhere other except, you know, when it's a local where you only, only had four, four or five miles to go. I see. I see. You know, there was a gentleman from Ranlo who came to Gastonia who was an organizer on the Flying Squadron. His name was um, Albert Hinson. Albert Simpson? Albert Hinson, H-I-N-S-O-N. Hinson. Hinson, right. Simpson. 
Hinson. Yes? No, no, H. H. Hinson. <laughs> no, Hinson. H-I-N-S-O-N. Hinson? That's right. Mm -hmm. Do you remember him? Well, there again, you, 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 you look now at the fact there was three, three to six hundred people working in every one of those plants. About 75% of every plant was unionized. Now, how could I possibly remember any particular one? Right. And I wasn't in the right. hierarchy. Right. That's I true. A, I was a son of a foreman in one of the plants, one they call the Flints. Right. One of the Flint plants. Yeah. It, there was two of those, first and second, or old and new, they call it. Old Flint and new Flint. Right. And the Groves plant was had a old Groves and new Groves. The Ozark plant, uh, a couple of miles up the road, I think it had just this, they just built on top of that one. It was about four or five stories high. The, the other two, four mills were all two-story mills. So you, you're saying that these plants, were, your plant was 75% organized? Oh, yeah. Give or take. There was no, there was no, there was no exact figure that you right. could ever use to describe any situation. Right. But it was a lot of people. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people, yeah. yeah and he could have got, uh, he could have got, uh, <laughs> Physical, let's put it that way. Yeah. Because they were red hot. Did it seem like there was ever a chance that, if not for the strike, that those, that that union would have worked and that it would have kept on going and they would have been able to get a contract and that kind of thing? No. I tell you, they just, <clears throat> the, 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 uh, the people in the South like that, I don't know where you're from, but the people in the South just were not uh, the union type people, really. They, they just they just couldn't stick together. They had too many <coughs> uh, irons in the fire or something like that, whatever you call it. Hatfield McCoy situation. Uh huh. But it but it, but a lot of but for seventy five percent of you know for these big numbers to join, it does seem like they were sticking together, don't you think? Well, they had some high powered organizers. They had some high powered organizers, and they had all these organizers had little lieutenants in charge of uh, little groups. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, it was very well well organized out of, out of the main office from wherever it was, the, the headquarters of uh, Textile Workers Union. Now, but now the organizers, I mean, from what I understand, there were very, very few paid organizers that came from the outside, that most of these organizers were local people. Uh, they, they were organized by the organizers. Right. <laughs> So right. they had jobs in the mill, and so they, they didn't necessarily need to be uh, paid. Exactly. Uh -huh. So they were like shop women, we call right. them now. Right, shop right. Shop stewards. Right, and there was a number, and did you know Did you know any of those people? Do you remember any no, of those I folks? I wasn't that deeply involved. In okay, that. but now, gentlemen... I'd like to say, I'd like to put myself on as a, as a sideline observer. A sideline observer. Well, you're a good observer, because you're a good storyteller, let me well, tell I, you. I'll just tell you how it was. Yeah, I know, that I don't mean stories like that it's not true. I'm just, yeah, most... And I'm speaking, I'm speaking now uh, in 1992, and you're speaking about 1934. Yes, sir. And your, your memories can wander. That's right, that's right. Well, your memory is very, very, very strong. Yeah. I mean, I, it's just like yesterday with me. Yeah, well, that's exactly what it sounds like. And, and uh, you know, in the Groves plant is where the uh, secretary, I mean, the uh, president and secretary treasurer, they worked in that plant. His Hartman fella and his Helton fella were the... Uh, but they both had jobs in the plant, so they didn't have to be paid, I don't guess. Now, let me make sure I got these guys' names right. These, the president and the vice president. Yeah. And the president and the secretary, right? Right. The president was... Bud yeah. Hartman. H-A-R-T-M-A-N. Right. Okay. Uh, the secretary treasurer, Claude Helton, H-E-L-T-O-N. Okay. And Claude is still around, which is he's great. He's still alive, and he's... Uh, He's missed two or three good chances to, to die from uh, cancer in the last few years. Really? Okay. And, uh, I think I, he, he, he spent a week with me in February of this year here in Florida. Really? Did you have a good time? <laughs> well, what can you do at 78? <laughs> How, how old are you, if you don't mind my ass? 38. 78. You're 78, too? Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Well, you sound great. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Do you get back to Gastonia much? Oh, I go uh, pretty regularly. Yeah. I go through there, go into my son's place, and in, in uh, cashiers. 
I see. I see. I got a lot of uh, nieces and nephews live there. They go by different names. Uh huh. One, one family in Morgan, my niece married one a Morgan fellow. He's on the sheriff's department. Really? Did you know a family? Did you know um, Gastonia R. J. Stroop? Stroop? Yeah. Well, I think he was a deputy or something like that. He was the secretary of his local 2115. Well, at that time, I think he was a. Uh, uh, at that time, yeah, well, he was several different things, even before the union and before after the union. Yeah, he finally ended up being uh, our local deputy on the sheriff's department. Really, I wonder if he's still around. Ah, uh, maybe Claude could help you. Yeah, maybe he could. Another guy. Another another party might be able to help you is uh, Bill Ward, W A R D. Who is he? He's Bill Ward. He now owns Ward's Funeral Home in Gastonia. He owns Ward's f Funeral Home. Mm -hmm. He'd be. He's the same age as Claude and I. Come up, went to school the same time we did. So uh -huh. he, he could give you some vivid descriptions of what it was like. Was, was he in the, that Grove too? Was he in the Union too? Well, to tell you the truth about it, I think his father had better control of him than my father had. <laughs> his father run the what in the world? And he had a, he had about hundred people under him in the Grove's plan. I'm getting what I think he was a spinning room supervisor. Uh huh. Now I, now, I have another person from South Gastonia called L.W. Mork, who lived on Victory Street in Gastonia. Uh, what's his last name? L Mork. L.W. Oh, Monk. M-O-N-K? M-O-N-K, Monk. Yeah. Uh, well, back in those days, we didn't go that, you know, they, you're talking about six, six to eight miles away from so uh, East Gastonia location, and mm. uh, people were sort of uh, community orientated back in those days. Right. Right. Well, now, if there was a wild party going on down in, in South Gastonia, we might have went down there and got together in a, yeah. somebody's car. The, the guy for um a, for uh, South Gastonia is um Andrew Smith. Well, Gastonia loaded with Smith. Loaded with Smiths. Okay. Now, did you happen to know a, what, another woman? Her name was um oh boy, she was the secretary. Of which union? I'll tell you, she was the lo secretary of the local union in North Belmont, and her name was Rosa May King. Well, now, North Belmont, you're talking about 15 miles, uh -huh. almost due east from where I live. Really? Okay. Of course, you know, the woods was full of textile mills. Right. With a hundred and something textile plants in the county. Right. You know, uh, I was mostly interested in girls in those days. <laughs> now, let me, let me ask something, Ernest. Is there... A way that I that we might be able to talk to you again in person. You want to talk to me in person? Yes, sir. Well, you done bled me dry. I will. No, no, no. It would be real helpful because a my partner is in here. Now, okay, I tell you what I do. If you're going to be in Gastonia in May, I'll be in Gastonia in May. You're going to be there in May. And I'll I'll uh, I'll call you and let you know what dates we're going to be there. Okay. All right. We're going to be there probably in the end of May. Well, I'll be going to the mountains in May okay. for a week, and then I'm going to Chicago for two weeks, Uh huh. then I'm going to Canada for the rest of the summer. For the whole summer? Uh, give or take. Really? So when are you leaving Florida? I said in May. In May, okay. Now, if we wanted to come visit you in Florida, would that be a pro okay? Well, let me see. Uh, what, what, what are we going to accomplish? What are we going to accomplish? Yeah, what are we trying to well, do? Well, I'll tell you. One of the things that we're trying to do with people what we have been doing, and it's been pretty rough, which is really why this article was written. Aside from people being really interested in what we're doing, like I said, we've had a tough time finding people who were there at the time who are willing to talk about it, and who... I don't know why anybody wouldn't talk about it, because, and I know in Claude's case, yeah. uh, he, he regrets to this day standing in the way of honest people who wanted to work. Uh-huh. So he's, he, is he sorry about having been part of the union, too? I imagine so. Really? He says if he had to do it over again, he would not do what he did. Mm. He was fired up with the union yeah. frenzy. Right. And do you think that um, he would not want to talk to us because he feels rather ashamed of it now? Uh, I don't think he's ashamed of it to that extent. Okay. I think that if, if you were, 
I say I'm going to be in Gastonia. You come, I'll be, uh, I have an Airstream travel trailer. I'll be parked inside his side yard. Okay. <laughs> and you, we have a, he has built a, a little, uh, we built two carpools. Built one, then he built another one, built it, bit double, built it a little bit longer, and it's an outside patio, covered patio. Uh-huh. We sit there and shoot the bull for hours on end. Okay, so we could hang out with you maybe. You could hang out, yeah. That would be in great. Gastonia. In Gastonia, yeah, that yeah, would be and super. And Bill Ward's house is around up the street from his. Okay. And a couple of the others. Okay, that sounds super. So, I know that we we're, we're, were going to try and go like the third week in May. Uh, that would cover me. That would cover you? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay, between now and then, if I want to drop you a line or something, do you want to give me your address? <laughs> I'm afraid you'll use it. You're afraid that I'll use your address? Yeah. Well, I might write you a little letter or something. You could write. You, you could, but I want to know what, what are we going to accomplish. Well, the, the thing, I like I... I want you to mention my name in these articles. I will, I'll lead you to as much as possible, but really? I, I want to get, just like, just like when the, the strike, that you, uh, I wanted to be in the action, but I didn't want to be involved. I didn't want to name you. Because, you know, we had right. too much to gain or too much to lose. Right, right, I understand. Well, now, are you in that same situation? In what situation? Well, in terms of losing something by talking? Well, you might, of course, you know, Gaston is loaded with people who I know. Right, right, right. And I might have told you something, you might have repeated and say, uh, then, then they would be, uh, might be hostile to me. Right. Well, I wouldn't want that to I'd happen. Want, I'd want somebody else, I'd want you to bleed them. And uh, tie into anything I might have said, just tie it all together in the overall picture. Right. Well, okay. Well, I'll tell you what we're you know what we're doing is we're making a, a documentary for television. Yeah, I know. I and know um, so we've been trying to you know locate people and record with them and get their stories on videotape. So and to really try and understand what happened back then and Did also. You know that we were uh, before the eight-hour shift. I worked in the textile plant as a, what they call a dolfer. Mm -hmm. Eleven hours a day. Wow. Uh, five and six days a week for ten and fifteen cents an hour. Mm. And uh, of course, you know, with uh, my three brothers and I and my father working. I had that, you know, and that they didn't have because a lot of those people in those days, they spent everything they made every day just as fast as they got it. Well, that was just on food, I suppose, right? Well, it, yeah. But they had extra money, though. They just went out and squandered it. Mm. A lot of people come out of the mountains that never had a thing in the world working those textile plants. And they have a little money. Sometimes they go spend it and let their wife and kids go hungry. We had, we had some of them one time in our, in our block. A man had... He come to the textile plant with eight children, got them all jobs in the mill, and he quit. He lived off of their salary and spent it and drunk it, but yet the kids went hungry. But there weren't that many people like that, were there? Uh, no. Take, take the overall numbers as a whole. There was only maybe three or four, and say in a whole town, that would be classified that, but it was all scandalous, you know. I'm sure. I'm sure. It's that way now, you and parts of the country. We have them right here in our section that some of them are just no damn good. Mm. Now, uh, this gentleman that you mentioned, that um, James Carter, who lives in Lake Wales? No, he did live. He died. He died. Oh, he's, he's deceased. Oh, okay. And his wife moved back to Gastonia. I see. I see. You ever hear tell well, you would, there was a place called Carter. It was Lake, L-A-K-E, Lake. And he had uh, a swimming pool, swimming area, and he he run that for quite a few years after, you know, between the time that and he got to be some kind of a job in Gaston. Then he moved on up to city county county, no city city manager, what he well was for quite a number of years. Huh. Well, that, well Gaston, you finally it was it's all over by then. Nobody thought you mentioned the strike. There's a lot of people say, well, what strike? You know. It just never, never minded it that much, hmm. even though it was really hard and a hard feeling uh, there for about a month. But it, it you, you know, <coughs> in your article, you see, uh, people had amnesia about it. They just forgot about it. They just, it just wasn't that important. Hmm. Do you think they wanted to forget about it? 
but don't you think they would? I mean, I, I, I don't, you know, nobody, but... I don't know if anybody got killed. Nobody got hurt. Right. They call people, one, they call one another names for two or three weeks, and then it was over with. Mm. But I, I, it seems like a lot of the feelings stuck, huh? There was a lot of hard feelings up and down uh, all the scales. We had a, we had a, a split society there. We had <clears throat> the underdogs, which was my crowd. Then you had the middle dogs, and they were the plant superintendents and their families. And then the mill owners, they were the, the high-scale echelons. And is it, um, did, did anything ever get resolved between those three crowds? No, nothing ever. They're still, it's still that way, Gaston. Mm. I just wasn't the kind of person put up with that sort of stuff itself. I wanted to make my own mark. Is that why you left town? Well, no. It's just you just couldn't make no money, Gaston. Really, real money. If you were a mill worker. For if sure. I was a mill worker, right. you'd be a mill worker, and you'd be on, uh, I call it hand-to-mouth existence all the time. Right. I just wasn't satisfied with that. Sure. Well, I can understand well, that. Well, my brother, older than I, ended up being circulation manager for the Gastonia Gazette. Hmm. Is he still around? Uh, he passed away 10 years ago. Oh. The ne next brother, Richard, he started off after that was over and went into the Gastonia Gazette as a press, running the press. And then uh, they opened up a second newspaper, I forget what the name of it was, and he became uh, the head man in the press room. Then that folded, and then he went to the Charlotte Observer and worked over that the rest of his life, and he died two years ago. Really? How did the press cover this whole episode? That whole episode uh, in the dead, dead, dead letter files in the Gastonia Gazette, I don't know what it's called, uh, they ought to have some some of those old newspapers. Uh-huh. Don't you think they would have? I would, I, would, I would think so. But do you recall the way that they talked about the strikers at the time? Well, of course, you know, they, the, as far as I can remember, it was just, it was, everything was news. They put it they put it in there indiscriminately. If you uh, read one day, next day, you'd, you'd hear what the other side said. The Atkins boys that owned the newspapers cared, could care less what went on. Really? They huh. took anything you said about it, they'd, they'd put it, print it if it was news. <laughs> I'm sure uh, Ben Atkins and his brother Stuart, <laughs> they were good poker players, both of them. And I've, I've seen it, watched them play poker and, and for hours on end in the Eagles Club down in Gastonia years and years ago. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, you're... <clears throat> it's really very, very, very interesting to hear the way that you're able to... Where you live, kid? I live in New York. Well, I passed through New York here not too long ago. You did? Yeah, just, of course, I don't like to ever stop there. <laughs> you're afraid to, huh? I didn't say I was afraid. Okay. It's just so hard to get around. In New York City, yeah, yeah. it certainly is. And uh, the three months I spent in New York City at the Brooklyn Navy Yard when I was in the Navy, I did learn all the subways. I could get most anywhere. Well, you could probably still do it. Well, <laughs> but you see, the subway's got a hell of a name now. That's true. Ooh. That's true. But I hate to be like that guy that shot a bunch of color boys in one of the sub, you know, and then you have your life defending yourself. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the thing that's been so interesting talking to, talking, uh, to you is the way that you've been able to tell me a little bit about that organization that took place before that strike. That's a part of the story that we've had a real tough time understanding. You mean the uh, lead up to the strike? Well, yeah, because it from... A, it was just normal campaign of uh, uh, one guy trying to get his next door uh, buddy, next door on his next machine. They'd talk about it, and then he'd finally get his buddy to join just because he was a buddy. Uh-huh. You know, it's one of those, uh, oh, come on, you're, if you aren't going to be with me, you're going to be against me attitude. I see. And... Uh, I, I don't know why I joined. I had no idea. <laughs> I just thought maybe be a, just like a, a joining a club. But did you did you did you believe that in the in what they were wanting in terms of better wages and more respect? Oh, and we all wanted better wages. And far as working conditions, why we thought eight hour days. We thought that was the ultimate in working conditions. When they had the forty hour week, that yeah. was that was. Uh, a condition that we already had. Now, what about the stretch out? Was that a problem in your mill? The stretch out. The stretch out. 
I, I don't believe I was involved in that. I don't remember anything in our plants that, that uh, would be classified as stretching out to work work load or anything like that. Of course, uh, you can only just do so much. And if I had three or four machines that I had to look after, I couldn't have looked after no more. Right. Now, in some plants, in some ways, somehow they might have been able to stretch stretch it where they could give you more work to do, but then there again, uh, the quality or quantity would go down. Right. Now, do you think I'm, uh, you think I should just qu call Claude Helton myself, or would it make any sense if you were going to be talking to him that you could sort of introduce? Oh, uh, I don't know whether you have the time frame or not. You meet me there in May. Well, you will be there in May, but what I'm thinking is maybe, I, I don't know if you, are you going to be talking to him in the next week or so? Uh, I was going to call, I was going to call him tonight about his health. He had a, oh, let me see now, he had a, he's had two bypass canals two bypass operations, let's put it that way. And he had cancer on the left side of his face. I don't know what it was, but anyway, when he was down here in February, it was already smoothed over. I hadn't saw him. I see him once a year, mm -hmm. twice a year. Uh-huh. And, uh, of course, if they can't get down, they come by here. Right. And, uh, this, his Mabel, his, his wife's daughter, they have families in Fort Lauderdale, see. So they come here and drop Claude and Mabel off, and then her daughter and her husband goes on to Fort Lauderdale for a week. I see. I see. Do, do you think when you talk to him tonight, you could tell him that we spoke and that I'd be very interested in talking with him? Now, is this your picture in the Shaw Observer? Um, what, tell me what, what I'm doing. George Stoney. Yeah, that's me. Judith Hilton. Health Ann, that's correct. Yeah. And this is you. Yeah. Well, you're a right nice looking kid. Well, thank you. <laughs> Like you about 30, 35. Uh, I'm 27. Well, I said 30. You're pretty close. I want to be uh, safe. And this, this gentleman here, he's, uh, he's got different name. Is he, what is he, you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to call him tonight. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 <laughs> well, he's not a sugar daddy. He's just my partner. <laughs> <laughs> I got it out of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Excuse me? I see, that's neither here nor there. That's true. That's true. Four times. Is that right? Four times? Four. Well, you're on number four now? Oh, I'm on number four, yeah. Oh, boy. How many children? Oh, boy. How I mean, when you say old girl. Okay. How many children do you have? Just that one. Well, that's enough, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> wow. What do you got? None. <laughs> you never know. You never know. know. That's true. That's true. You never know. Well, maybe someday. Sorry, meanwhile, you never can tell. Meanwhile, I'm still, I'm too busy working on this project. Don't get too busy to enjoy life, not kid. Okay, well, thank right you. Right out there in front of you. Just grab it. I appreciate that very much. Okay, now, so... Let me ask you, um, we could, we'd love to see you in May, and if you could tell Mr. Helton that we would like to talk to him, and that, you know, that I'm a nice person and I don't bite, uh, that would be really useful. Uh, I, I don't know, I think he is very, very active in the same community for 78 years. Yeah. He's also been school superintendent, in the Sunday school superintendent in the Flint Grove Baptist Church in Gaston. Really? has been uh, president of the Lions Club, Secretary Trace of the Lions Club, mm -hmm. very active in club work, uh, and very active in church work. He's been, I don't know what you call it, chairman of the deacons or something, but anyway, he's almost run that church for years. Really? He has been active during the last four or five years. And as I say, maybe he might want you to be incognito, you know, confidential stuff. You know, right. I, I'm sure he wouldn't want his picture without you got his permission, of course. Oh, of course, of course. But well, we would never I'll do tell, anything. I'll tell him tonight. Okay. Yeah, we are just trying to get all sides of the story. and All sides? That's right. You know good and well, you, there's only one side as far as a mill owner is concerned. Right. Them, work them like hell and pay them as little as you can. We used, that's what we used to say. And do you still believe that? Well, I've been in the business world now, and naturally, I, I, when I hire people now, when I run the mo when I owned the motel down East Gas not East Gas well it was east of Gastonia on seventy four going to Charlotte and it was called the Colony Motel. Yeah. We had about sometimes we had five maids working. 
and uh, when I when I first started, I just called all the motels up and down the highway between Gaston and Charlotte. What do you pay your maids? You right. Know? And that's how I decide their salary. Right. Now, whether that was too much or too little, it didn't matter to me. I wanted to stay in line with the rest of them. Right. Okay. Naturally, I, I didn't I didn't work them hard because at eight by twelve o'clock they had to, they had to be out of the motel because the guests would start coming in from one o'clock on. Right. And those that were there and staying over would naturally want their beds made up and floors vacuumed and that sort of stuff. Well, do, do, like I said, there, well, there are still a number of sides to the story because the, the you mill... Better, you better talk to the mill owners. This Reagan fellow you talk about owned the Reagan mill. Yeah. He can give you one side of it. Oh, we did talk to him. And we talked to Jake Gray. Yeah, Gray was one of them. Yeah. And what about uh, Mr. Myers? Or Mr. Myers' son? We haven't talked to him yet. Um, I think we're going to be speaking to Mr. Leinberger when we go back. Leinberger, Mills, and Bell on, yeah. Right. right. So we, we are getting, you know, we're trying to get both sides. But one side that we haven't gotten yet, particularly in your area, was the explanation of how these people organized way before this strike and the fact that it was a very sort of okay. processed, organized first, campaign. First, that, that part of it, I know why it was happened is it, it's Roosevelt. Right. It, it getting it uh, declared illegal to stop them from organizing. Right. Well... Now, I don't know the, the mill people, whether they would say that was one of the key key factors or not would be another question. Right. I see. Well, so now, that's... You know, in the, in the New England states where most of the textile workers come from or where the plants, uh, the, big, the biggest textile industry was in Hartford, Connecticut, I think. You mean... Uh, oh, from the north. Huh? From the north, you mean? From the New England states, where the textile industry first right, started. Right, right, right. When it came over from England. Right. Well, yeah, and then there's a lot of them in Lowell, Massachusetts. Lowell, well, Massachusetts is <clears throat> a big textile center. Uh huh. There's literally thousands of people working. Right. Well, like I said, one of the things that we're really struggling to document and um, is. They did not stop us from organizing. Well, that's exactly what we're they should. They, they, what no word said about to any of us there in the, the groves and flint mills, as far as I could tell, the plant managers, the overseers, uh, the boss man, or whatever, I don't think any of them ever tried to stop us from joining the union. Mm -hmm. In any way whatsoever, by threats or otherwise. Right. They just had to take it one thing at a time, the way I look at it. Well, I'll tell you, it would um, really be a pleasure to, to, to talk with you some um, in May. And I hope that Mr. Hartman would be, now, Mr. Hartman, I mean, Mr. Helton. I think Mr. Hartman has unpassed away, but some yeah. of his children uh, were pretty good-sized kids at that time. They might remember some of the things that their father had to go through with. That would... Make Claude would uh, Mr. Helton would know that. Okay. Okay, well, I would... I'll ask him to, uh, I'll ask him to try to contact some of Bud's family. Okay, well, let me, I would really love to be able to speak with Mr. Helton himself, and I, I hope that he'll agree to speak with us. Well, okay, good deal. Okay. And uh, this 800 number, we can talk all we want to on this number, and I can call you back tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> well, let you know that you're welcome to call him. Okay, that would be wonderful. I well, would really uh, appreciate that. You get it from his point of view. Right. That would be super. Okay, good deal. Okay, thank you so much, you're Ernest. talking to you. Now, if, it, uh, if I owe you anything, let me know. I'll you, see you check for it. Oh, you don't owe me a thing. <laughs> Come on. But I would love to have your full name, Ernest. Well, uh, my full name is Ernest B. Gant, G-A-N-T. Ernest B. Gant. There's one of us left in Gaston, you. Uh-huh. And he is inactive. He's been retired now for about five years. Right. Okay. They, they, the family of six died out. Nobody took the place. The two older brothers didn't meet. The older and younger brother had no children. I had one. I see. No Gants. No Gants. Now, and, uh, there's plenty of Gants in a little town called Davison College, Davison, North Carolina. Are those your kinfolk? Oh, they're cousins. By the, well, the woods is full of them. You throw a rock, you hit Gant or somebody related to a Gant in Davis, North Carolina. <laughs> That's very funny. So that must be, do you go back there to visit? Oh, yeah. They, the family reunion is in Davis. Oh, that May, must be nice. In May. Oh, that must be great. There'll be 40 or 50 of them. Wow. 40 or 50 Gants. Huh? 40 or 50 Gants. No. There's only be about half of them Gants. There'll be half other type 
I see. Okay. Well, I, I, I really... There were six girls and six boys in the Jim Gant family in Davidson, North Carolina. Okay. Well, I certainly look forward to having the opportunity to talk to you again. And I appreciate you calling and telling me about Mr. Helton. The biggest problem that we've had is finding people who had any real kind of structured roles, you know, like Mr. Helton. So they're very important for us to be able to talk with. I, now, one thing I want you to know, if, if you do get Claude Helton talking, yeah. they say, now, uh, don't worry about the cost of this phone call. Uh, you know, you're, it's yeah. your, your company phone. Exactly. You're trying to get some... Uh, back my background and information for a dialogue. Right. And uh, try to get him relaxed. And I think I give you enough of background. His Baptist church work and his uh, Lion Club work. You know, just lead him into a relaxing that's situation. Okay, that's great. You, <laughs> you should be a talk show host. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Why not? Okay. I don't know. I, I couldn't afford it. You couldn't afford it. Oh, made too damn much money really. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm I'm glad you're comfortable. That's super. Comfortable? I'm super comfortable. You're super? I just paid $50,000 from a travel trailer the other day. For your? Travel, Airstream travel. Wow. Trailer. Wow. All aluminum thirty-four foot trailer. Wow. Three people in it. Wow. Well, that's great. They took, the, they took the blonde away and they had, had the advertisers, you know? Uh-huh. I wanted to say it put the blonde with it. He said, no, couldn't do that today. Oh. That picture's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you, um, I hope we talk to you again soon. And, do. Okay. You probably call me. I'll call you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.